to the April episode of IGE Talks. My name is David Blakesley, and I'm a member here at IGE, the Institute for Global Education, located at 1119 Wealthy Street Southeast in Grand Rapids, Michigan, East Town, just a couple doors down from Wealthy Theater, kind of our local landmark. If you've never seen this program before, IGE Talks is kind of a, a monthly talk show featuring just ordinary citizens from uh, all walks of life here in Kent County and Grand Rapids, Michigan. West Michigan, uh, Michigan's number two metropolis, if you will. Uh, what we do each month, we just get together and talk about various topics. Sometimes they're uh, issues ripped from the headlines of the day. Sometimes they're more broad scale cultural issues or talking about life in other parts of the world, uh, just uh, kind of connecting with our, our, with our group's name, the Institute for Global Education, you know, motto, uh, think global, act local. And so, uh, Institute for Global Education is a nonprofit group here, based here in Grand Rapids. We've been around since 1980, and uh, this program is kind of our one of our uh, you know, kind of public vehicles that gives people a chance to learn what we're about, and also gives people a chance to speak what's on their mind. So tonight, our topic is called predatory lending, and it really is a it's a, a a topic that really touches on a lot of the things that are happening in our economy, in our society. Uh, to working class and uh, poor people, and even people of some affluence who also can get caught up in some of the uh, kind of tricky schemes and maneuvers that the, the lords of finance in this country and, and other parts of the world have uh, concocted over the years to uh, sometimes uh, you know take a little bit more from people than perhaps is necessary just to make the bottom line. Square up. So we're going to be talking tonight with some people who have some expertise, who've been involved in this issue for some time, and we're not only just going to talk about the problems, we're going to talk about some potential solutions uh, with an economy that's still rebounding, maybe uh, rebounding a lot faster for some than for others, uh, with prospects <coughs> still very grim for a lot of folks who are just living check to check, or even wondering where they're going to be next month financially. Uh, this is an issue that perhaps... Uh, relates to where a lot of us are at. Uh, as for myself, you know, I lived in somewhat middle class stability and relative comfort for a number of years, so I expect to learn a lot tonight. But I also have had some experiences uh, with friends and acquaintances, and I've been kind of hard up myself financially in the past. And I feel like, you know, looking back now, I could have been a lot smarter consumer. So our, uh, our purpose here tonight is both to educate and hopefully to entertain a little bit, have a conversation worth tuning in and listening to. So uh, just a little bit about myself, but let's kind of find out who else is in our group tonight, and I'll just ask the person to my right here to introduce yourself, uh, your name, and however else you want to identify what you do. Um, my name is Jordan Bruxford, and I serve as the director of the MICA Center. Okay. My name is Sue Ortiz, and I'm the director of housing and family services with the Inner City Christian Federation. And Chester Lowe, I'm one of the board members of IGE here. I'm Kate Shockey, and I'm a member and volunteer at IGE, and I'm a local artist. My name's Lori Pearsma. I just recently retired from the healthcare field, and I'm getting to, into some different advocacy issues. I'm Kathleen Russell, a retired educator, um, and I work on many issues. The most recent probably was to ban fracking in Michigan. Mike Franz, uh, IGE board and uh, MICA Center, especially the prison justice um, beyond prison school working group. Kim McKeon, and I've been a volunteer at IGE, and I'm also a new board member here at IGE. Cheryl Reinstra, and I'm on the MICA Center Beyond Prisons work group and the Restorative Justice Coalition for Kent County. I'm Amy Carpenter Lewis. This is my first time here, and I am Outreach Director for Open Door Center for Self Directed Teens. I'm Randy Gabriels. I'm a member of the MICA Center, and I work on predatory lending along with Jordan. Um, I'm also a member of the board of the Restorative Justice Coalition of Kent County. Well, thank you all for coming out, both of you uh, new visitors. Uh, I think you're going to bring some great perspective and expertise, and also for our regulars, it's always good to reconnect here. We do this program on the first Thursday of every month, so if you ever want to be a part of it, if you're interested in what you see here tonight, uh, like us on Facebook, find us on the Internet, just type in uh, IGE Talks to your preferred search engine, 
you'll find this because you know, the archive of shows that goes all the way back to 2004. Uh, but I'd like to kind of talk, uh, talk about this tip of topic and uh, just begin with a story, more, more of a personal anecdote. Um, I live in Wyoming, Michigan, a little suburb to the southwest side of Grand Rapids. And years ago, uh, when I lived there, you know, when, uh, we would drive down 28th Street past Rogers Plaza and the old Rogers Department store. And I would joke to my kids, well, behold, here's downtown Wyoming, uh, the great mm -hmm. metropolis uh, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, West Michigan. And of course, 28th Street, for those locals who know it around here, is more of a retail shopping strip that's kind of seen better days. Uh, the big time retail action has moved on to other places. But among the landmarks, if you will, of that area, uh, right across from Wyoming City Hall, uh, Wyoming, Michigan, the city motto is the city of vision and progress. A pretty lofty uh, aspiration, if you ask me, although local Wyoming politics don't really seem to bear it out, out very well, in my opinion. Uh, Wyoming City Hall, right there at the corner of the Hoop and 28th Street. Uh, there used to be on the other side of the street a, a candy store. I think it was Russell Stover. It might have been mm -hmm. a different brand, but I think it was a Russell Stover candy store. And of course, yeah. Russell Stover and boxed candies in general, it's a little bit of an antiquated mm -hmm. notion. We don't really think about purchasing candies in that way anymore. And so the Russell Stover, Stover candy store went out of business one day and uh, the building got demolished. And I just had a curiosity, what's going to be in this central location, right down at the hub of, of Wyoming, right across from City Hall. And a structure went up and I was intrigued to see what it was going to turn into. And then one day I saw a big yellow banner and a big black letters that says cash store. It's like, what the hell is this? <laughs> cash store. <laughs> Who goes to the store to pay money to buy cash? It's well, like a money tree. Exactly. <laughs> well, you think so. But a cash store, a payday loan store. And it just, it was a kind of a harbinger of doom as far as I saw it. That, that mm -hmm. Wyoming as a city was kind of hitting the skids mm -hmm. a little bit. That uh, right across from this presumably prime real estate from City Hall and all the other shopping and everything else going on around there was this uh, kind of, you know, uh, loan shark, if you will. Uh, kind of glossied up and kind of cleaned up as a nice retail establishment with this uh, innocuous sounding name, mm -hmm. Cash Store. Uh, so that's just my little sort of lead-in, I guess, if you will, uh, just a little recollection of uh, sort of disappointment that, uh, that we maybe could have done better as a city. Uh, Jordan, why don't you tell us just a little bit about your work and, and maybe kind of get the conversation started uh, out of my stories run its course. Sure. So the Micah Center is a coalition of churches in the Grand Rapids area that work together uh, on various justice issues. Our motto comes from Proverbs 31 and 8 and 9, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for, a right, for the rights of all who are destitute. Mm -hmm. Speak up and judge fairly, defend the rights of the poor and needy. Um, we've been engaged with the issue of predatory lending for several years now, uh, concerned about the few good choices that people who are living paycheck to paycheck have when their paycheck doesn't uh, stretch enough to get them to the end of the month. Um, and we're also aware of what happens when people are on that financial precipice. So they need to pay their electricity bill or their electricity gets shut off. Mm -hmm. And not only does their electricity get shut off, but then they're assessed a $250 penalty. So now not only do they owe all the money that they owe on their, their electricity bill, but plus another 250 bucks. A major, a major blow, a week's pay for people who are scraping by. Right. Yeah. So when you're in that situation and you don't have what I have and what I imagine uh, a lot of us around the room have, which is uh, people in our immediate circle who, if we really needed to approach them for a loan, it might be awkward. We might not want to do it, and we'd have to swallow our pride. But but we could get it. Sure. Um, but not everyone has that. Or they've tapped all their other acquaintances out to mm -hmm. the max, or their other friends are just mm -hmm. as struggling as they are. Right? Yeah. That's often the case. Right? Yeah. And so, so that's where these places step step in, because no bank is, um, at least um, traditionally, banks have not been interested in offering loans, you know, for such a small dollar amount. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not worth their time. It's not worth their worth their paperwork. But these cash stores, payday loan stores, have have stepped in, uh, filling that that niche that hole in the, the mainstream bacon industry and providing a product which certainly there are a lot of people who 
um, who are going for those in these places have proliferated. Like they're all over. You the can place. hardly right. believe. I mean, More uh, than McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Thirty-two yeah. or so in our general vicinity. How many? Thirty-two. Thirty-two, and we're talking about like yeah, East County, Grand Rapids, County. That's official ones. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, exactly. Well, yeah, right. That's, that's a good the point. These are retail establishments. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and, yeah. And isn't the difficulty that they're not actually everywhere? That they're in very particular areas. Well, well, certainly you, there are probably not too many over in Ada and Cascade, right? <laughs> 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 they're they're uh, in urban strip malls and, mm -hmm. and along the kind of major shopping mm -hmm. corridors. I mean, 28th Street, which I drive back and forth every day. I work over in Kentwood. I live in Wyoming, and I, that's just my landscape that I mm -hmm. plow through on my way back and forth from my job. And I probably mm -hmm. feel like I pass about eight or ten of them along mm -hmm. the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot along that stretch, yeah. for yeah. sure. Yeah. But I like your point about that those are the ones that have the big signs out mm -hmm. front. But there's so many here in town that have uh, sort of the back door uh, mm -hmm. sorts of lending things going on and and people are paying just as much money to borrow money from those small shops as they do at the, the bigger payday lenders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for someone who d isn't familiar with what it's like to take out a payday loan, uh, I encourage you to step into one of these places and to look at the interest rates um, because you almost have to see them to believe, you, believe them. Does anyone here know What's your guess? Well, I, you know, I would think it's probably going to be somewhere in the twenty-five to thirty percent. But I mean, but they don't they mark them down so it's like interest per week. I mean, it's it's really it down to a very. I think being like a thousand percent a year or something. It's but if you yeah, yeah, get the annual, the annual, the annual percentage. Okay. Yeah, and, and, yeah. It's and, typically about fifteen dollars for every hundred that you borrow. When you stretch that out over the course of a year, the annual percentage rate then. Ends up being right around three to four hundred percent um, annual percentage rate. If you don't pay that principal off, it the just kind of piles up, right? Yeah. right doesn't right. truth in lending force them to reveal this to people? It it is usually. I mean, I've walked in these stores and they do have it on the wall. On the so wall, it's there. Mm -hmm. and it'll be in the no, papers that they sign this. Or even in the fine mm -hmm. print. Yes. But but the thing they're taking advantage of people who really don't even understand how to decipher all that right. and think out what we do. And I mean, you know, most of us with college educations, I mean, if you really want to buckle down and read that, you're going to be laboring over that text for a while to figure out what exactly what it's saying, you know? And, and if you're desperate, and then, you're, when you're in a you're desperate anyone who's going to say yes. Yeah. Oh, you've well, got money. Let me clarify for us. Yeah. Um, in another avenue of working on payday lending, I put these together. Okay. Um, Maybe we can flash one of these to the camera or edit it in. But go ahead and talk us through it. And this what is what it costs to borrow $300. Um, in the state of Michigan, you can borrow $100 at 15%, $100 at 14%, on down to zero at a time. So I, I took a re relatively average call number, $300, and I calculated this out. After two weeks, you owe $342. So you've gone from 300 to 342 in the first two weeks. After four weeks, you owe $390. After six weeks, you owe $444.53. By 10 weeks, it's up to $577. So nearly twice the $300 you started with after 10 weeks. After 12 weeks, it's up to 659. Um, by 16 weeks, it's up to 857. And by 18 weeks, you owe more than three times what you started at with $977.39. Well, can you, someone clarify for me that uh, when they say uh, we, we get your paycheck, how, how how do, they, how do you default on, on that if they ha have your paycheck? And how do they get it in the first place? Well, you have to have a bank account in order to get one of these loans. And you sign an agreement that they can pull the amount due in two weeks out of your account. So it's a payday advance, basically. So what, what, how they're marketing it is that you have to... Um, sign on the dotted line that in two weeks they can pull this money out of your account.
However, well, surely they don't all have. Uh, not everybody has a bank account that they're lending money to. True. Actually, and they, the fact well, of the matter is, they, they want you to. For these call. loans, for these payday loans, you have to have a bank account, and you have to sign an authorization to have an ACH or uh, electronic fund transfer um, uh, debit from your account in two weeks for the amount due. So However, you can also go back in and re-up the loan. And so Randy's oh, okay. point here right. is very well taken. The average payday borrower is going to redo that loan nine times before he or she is going to get out of it. So that, that's just an average. Right. So is it true that, um, say you borrow $200, and if in two weeks you have $100 in your account, will the payday loan company take that 100 or do they want the whole 200 the whole so yeah. if you don't have the whole 200 in your account yeah. then you have to re apply to yeah. do another loan for yeah. a higher fee and right keeps so that that's why money. all this increase in uh, fees exactly so the the numbers that we are looking at that randy um, developed those are somebody that has never paid on the principal correct but they just get you know, well, they're not allowed to pay on the principal yeah, until the they, they're able to pay everything back at once. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So so you can't make partial yeah. payments. Oh, there are no partial payments yeah. allowed. Oh, it's it's all, all or nothing. And if, if you can't pay all of it, then you have to re-borrow. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the, the cycle so that people are set up for, to be in a cycle mm -hmm. of high interest rate debt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. they may think, well, my paycheck, my, my next paycheck should cover 300 bucks, but then something else comes up, the water bill comes due, or the car breaks down, they got to get brakes on, their, their kids have a, an accident, they got to pay a, a, wait, a doctor's fee or something like that. Well, shoot, I guess I'll have to throw another couple hundred bucks on there, and, and the trap is sprung. Right. Yeah. Mike, Mike, you were bringing up, what about um, usury laws? I mean, isn't there some sort of <laughs> laws that... <laughs> Well, those, again, the law is yeah. what the politicians define <laughs> yes. it as, you know. And I'm sure these in, these lobbies, these <coughs> groups, have a lot of money that have paved the way. My my hunch has to be that this was once regulated and now it's been deregulated. It credit, card, credit cards are much more highly well, regulated. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah it, it's actually yeah. regulated, and, and uh, the payday lenders fall under what's called a uh, deferred presentment license, and it gives them permission to act in this manner, to to call the loan due. In fact, they can't operate otherwise. Uh, they can call the loan due in two weeks, or they must call the loan due in two weeks because of those regulations. And so um, that's how people are, are being trapped in this. Because And the, the petty lenders are actually following the law as it's written under that act. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the, a very important thing to do is to um, eventually, once mm -hmm. we have an alternative for people, is to attack attack that particular legislation mm -hmm. because it's really a horrible way um, right. to, to allow businesses to operate. Because really, the payday loan lenders are sort of absolved from any claims of conscience. They yeah. well, this is all we can do. We can only claim, and yeah. so they've been sort of, mm -hmm. I don't know. There's no okay. So who? Cool. Yeah. Are the payday lenders who well, identified? That that is an interesting question. I don't have an answer to that, but it seems like this well, is probably we have answers. this we is have a, probably answers. a safe bet for people who have a fair amount of, of cash assets. I mean, these really are secured loans. You know, they're not secured with merchandise, <coughs> but they're secured with a bank sweat account, and toil, yeah. and a bank account. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So the then bank, the banks are complicit. Well, the banks, I'm sure, are profiting from this as well. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, if, if the money isn't there when they go to take it out, then the banks actually I can name you three sources them. right now that are involved heavily in it, or were. Mm -hmm. One of them was Fifth Third Bank, and they recently pulled out after we contacted them, right? Mm -hmm. And and we talked to them, and we told them how wrong this was, and they said, well, maybe we shouldn't be involved in this. But some that are still doing it and are notorious for it are Bank of America and Wells Fargo. Now these are big Wells Fargo got out of it. Wells Fargo got out? Yeah, I thought you got remember that day yeah. we were all okay. excited because yeah. you were talking about it. But that's what my question gone. was, you know, yeah. who is doing it and who yeah. was and who is and why did they leave? Uh -huh. I mean, if we're, we're yeah. trying to take the source of the money away, we have to go after the money lenders too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the, the mainstream bank 
mainstream banks, by and large, are getting out of payday lending. Um, you could still point a finger at Bank of America because uh, I've read that they have a $300 million credit line out to Advance America, which is the largest mm -hmm. payday lending franchise. Um, so how, how, how they're connected is, is um, would be interesting to find more about, but um, it's certainly true that, that they have been a, a powerful lobbying mm -hmm. force uh, and where, whereas back in the 80s, uh, you couldn't charge, you know, uh, these these kinds of interest rates, uh, and still, I think there are 18 states now where you can't charge more than 36%. Yeah. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, Michigan is not one of those states that that has uh, a cap that keeps people in the, the double digits. I did have a chance to just look at the Wikipedia article on predatory lending, and I saw there were a number of states with some legislation, and Michigan mm -hmm. was not listed there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you put the name Bank of America next to these, and it really does legitimize this enterprise. It's just, it's just another source of financing for people who don't have the credit rating or the, the property holdings. And so I can sort of see how this was spun in boardrooms. It's, almost a humanitarian gesture or, or helping the little guy, you know, <laughs> get through those tight scrapes, you know. Right. Uh, I was going to ask, uh, does uh, Chase, the, the Chase Bank, have any uh, input or... I don't know what you were going to say. Well, I, I think that um, it's important to note that at this point, because they've been in operation for so many years, these places are functioning on their own now. It's a well, very profitable... Uh, situation and, that's, and, and that's so what they don't really even need those right. um, finances. The proliferation anymore. we talked about, I mean, was there check and go, advance America, yeah. the cash, yeah. I mean, there, there, there's dozens and I, everything from what you might call almost like a mom and pop operation to a more of a sophisticated yeah. chain yeah. or yeah. franchise, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. But I could, I could sort of see if you've got a pool of cash and you want to get quick returns on, on lending that out mm -hmm. with fairly minimal risk, this is a nice little lucrative game to get into. Yeah. Yeah. What about those people that do not have bank accounts? We also hear of people that just, you know, there's no bank in their neighborhood so they don't have right. bank accounts. Well, Can they borrow from that and then well, there's probably other pay with their life they if they can't have pay The old that loan way. shark uh, idea, you know. Or like pawn shops too. Or right, or pawn right. shops too. Well, but, you know, if you don't pay back, they're, you know, Cousin Vinny's going to come out and kneecap yeah. you. Know, so. <laughs> 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 Go ahead. Well, yeah. I just, this is probably a little off because Chester brought up Chase Bank, okay. which is interesting in my mind uh, in, in, in terms of uh, Chase Bank is one of the few banks that have attempted to offer reparations to African Americans, you know, for their participation okay. in so, slavery. Okay, I'm not aware uh, of that. Because <coughs> in Louisiana, they have a grant program for college students. Uh, and Chase does or State of Louisiana? Well, Chase... Uh, They're sponsoring this? Let's see, Chase is... Chase, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. Right. Yeah, because J.P. Morgan, uh, <laughs> in its infinite years, were definite participants in slavery. Okay. Okay, okay. so, so, so J.P. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase has a fund in Louisiana now. It doesn't extend to anybody else except for people in Louisiana, which would be nice if they were to extend that more because it's the banks and the financial institutions, uh, the insurance companies that were participants in, in the slave trade more so than people trying to ask the government for reparations. Mm -hmm. We should be talking to banks and the lending institution which proffered the, mm -hmm. Huge, but anyway, that's a little sidebar, and I didn't want to yeah. mess up the ebb and flow. Well, Help clarify, man. Is that what you were thinking of as well? Yeah, that's when you raised that. You know what? Yeah. I, I used Obviously. to um, work with the organization that uh, was uh, bound, or I should say, uh, based down in uh, New Orleans, mm -hmm. and I was familiar with some of that, mm -hmm. but I didn't know if it was applicable up here too. No, yeah. it's not. Yeah. Do okay, yeah. you think Chase is doing that sort of as community relations down in Louisiana because it just became too? Egregious for them to just ignore the issue. Well, that there was there was push. It was demand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's been demand for reparations throughout the uh, uh, <laughs> the United States, 
but I think, you know, in my mind, you know, the demand on the government per se is, is kind of like we shouldn't demand the government, we should demand the government charge the institutions that profited mm -hmm. off of it. Because there are still fortunes. Because they yeah. are founded. Yeah. They are still, like, and they're still doing it with what, we, what we're talking about with yeah. payday loans. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and all this redlining and all this adverse lending uh, into the African American, to the poor track, poor census tract, and the egregious uh, types of interest rates that they're charging, it's still a form of uh, slavery. And probably a lot of the institutions bought other institutions. It's like with the mortgages yeah. where companies bought um, companies that did terrible things <coughs> in the mortgage market. and. I suspect that they don't want to be on the wrong side of a bad lawsuit where they look really horrible. Right. Right. But are there any statistics on how uh, how many people of different racial makeups have taken advantage of or been exploited by this loan situation? There, there is a study um, done that found out that all socioeconomic factors being equal, payday loansters were two and a half times more likely to locate in a neighborhood of color. Mm -hmm. So that's, okay. I'm speaking to uh, so I'm poverty really, first and color second, or color first, poverty second. I mean, it's, it's obviously they're predatory on the people who need, mm -hmm. need it the most, mm -hmm. people who don't I'm have the most. money. I, I'm looking at how much of these businesses have what you might call repeat customers, people mm -hmm. who I mean, you yeah. know, we, we talk about the compounding problems of debt, yeah. and, and and yet they're still in business. People haven't just said, oh, I ain't going there, I ain't touching that. I mean, some people obviously have been burned and will never go through that door again. Or maybe they go from one payday lender to another because they kind of, they're in the hole with this one, but this guy will give them a break. I mean, is that how it works? Well, um, what I know for sure, and, and Jordan can probably help out with this, is that um, People in Michigan uh, are allowed to have up to two payday loans okay. at one time. Okay, so there's um, a limit on that. There well. is a limit on how many, and, and a person's name actually goes into a registry. Okay. And so they're able to check at the payday lending stores how many loans they have. But there is no regulation on the online. Oh, loans. okay. There's so a, that, you can that's go online and, wow. yeah, oh, and, wow. and really, oh, and really compound their mm -hmm. problem. So so terribly by adding insult to injury. And, and yeah. Is it a little bit like gambling because you yeah. you're just taking a chance that you'll have the money? I mean, does it have that same addictive characteristic? I would say it's more based on need. In my opinion, yeah, they, they're, they're, it, yeah, it's not right. like they want to. They, they, they probably realize after they're in it, yeah. and many families who come to us at ICCF. Uh, realize what a problem uh, they've created in their lives, and but they just can't get out at that point. So it's a it's a need to keep mm -hmm. going back and recycling the loan until something gives. Um, maybe if taxes come through or, mm -hmm. or or something like that, then they can pay it off and they can be comfortable for a little while until the next emergency comes up. Yeah, and there's a, there's a there's a powerful psychological effect of being broke, but then going to a place that will give you five crisp one hundred dollar bills right. and so you you feel like okay well this is you know right. it's, it's a relief nice new money. it's a relief yeah. but then the, the, the very and I'm sure the people in these pay they're they're not you know harsh they're not you know mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're yeah. sweet they're yeah. kind they're cunning yeah. you yeah. have found a friend <laughs> well, except when people and are picketing in front of their well yeah that's why we're just misunderstood that is why I was disappointed when Jasmine left because Jasmine and her two kids mm -hmm. put together this wonderful report that they gave us mm -hmm. that really tracks the way that payday lenders mm -hmm. are really wily in jumping around the any restrictions that are put in their place well, and shifting things yeah. from here to there, um, you know, dropping loan amounts or, or interest amounts just below whatever is it's calling interest rates spending. fees. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, handling these yeah, convenience fees yeah. and all those euphemisms, right? Um, uh, yeah, I'm sure these people are very clever and very skilled at shifting the money from here to there to stay within the letter of the law, but keep the keep the hooks to the end. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just, just recently, didn't the um, 
uh, City Commission of Grand Rapids refused to some somebody wanted to relocate and relocate in Grand Rapids yeah. and then the city city commission got involved and I don't think they could absolutely refuse kind it. But they gave them enough right? they gave them enough pressure that they, they gave up. Well I think but they, they wanted to look yeah. into the funding sources and they said this ain't worth it. We don't yeah. really want to, you know, let the sun shine in and, um, and so yeah. we'll just take our business elsewhere. Jordan yeah. and I were at that meeting and Jordan did a wonderful job because what he did for us was he presented a sheet, which as I understand it, tells, just gives the addresses of these agencies. Mm -hmm. um, and about the same time he was handing them this form, Walter Brame realized that the council, which was really struggling with, is there a legal way for us to restrict this? Can we do this in a way that's legitimate? Uh, and they were concluding no. They were about to apologize to us and disapprove it. Mm -hmm. And Walter Graham brought up the idea that we could possibly, well, maybe the panel can table it. Mm. And, and by having that sheet from Jordan, they were able to say they were going to table it in order to study yeah. the concentration issue mm -hmm. and whether mm -hmm. it's, it's become like a, an adult theater sort of or the liquor store, uh, yeah, yeah, kind of a, a urban light yeah. type of thing, yeah. right. So uh, I really yes. thank Jordan and Walter for taking that step, which which gave us that that, that initial denial, and then they decided uh, we're not interested in pursuing this any longer. Mm -hmm. huh. is, you know, and they always say that the slogan, follow the money. Is there is there transparency of who are the stakeholders in these businesses? Can we track it back to individuals or certain wealthy people who have put funds or front corporations together. I mean, do we know who the money bags are behind these enterprises? Well, yeah. You know, there, there um, was a gentleman, and I, his name escapes me now, but I recall back in 2009 or, or so when reading about um, his assertions of how, how this is such a necessary thing that, that there's uh, such a need in the communities and he wasn't wrong that need is there it's a, a huge need to have yeah. affordable lending and justice in, right. in, in our community for people who, who want to access credit and a capital. safety net right. Right. All exactly of sure. all of those things um, and, and so but and still to this day I know that he will assert that um, these are and he's making billions of dollars every yeah. year. Uh, he and, and his corporation um, off the backs of the people who are Question. You, you had also mentioned earlier that if you take out a payday loan, your name goes into a registry of some sort. Does that have, have an automatically like devastating effect on one's credit score? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> just the fact that you, even, if you, even if you pay it off the next week and everything, just the name of the, your name is in this list, mm -hmm. that's right. creditors are like, okay, that's one of them. I'm glad <laughs> you said that because okay, I was you. ready to go into one of these places right. and borrow 200 bucks, you know, just right. to kind of play and see what's going Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's credit definitely... Credit is impacted by, yeah. by the type of credit that you use. Even um, for people who get those checks in the mail from Wells Fargo, mm -hmm. congratulations, you've just been approved for $1,150. Yeah. Just take this to your bank and cash it. Yeah. When you do that, you enter into a contract and your credit score just, bam, hit, right. you know, 30, 40 points right there. I remember yeah. that. Yeah, yeah that's how, to know. Yeah. How, to know. That's huh? yeah. how the money yeah. flows in this country, if you back up a little bit, you know, go back to 2008 and the banking crisis right. when they had all of these predatory, if you don't want to call them that, but what do yeah. they call them? Things so, that they were selling all over the place and, and then finally the dumped in Europe on the poor countries like Spain and Italy and who are in economic devastation today as partly as a result of that. Uh, <coughs> when we gave the banks all that money from the federal government, they sat on it. They would not loan it to anybody and we couldn't get the economy moving again and small businesses couldn't get loans, period, right? right. And if you, and today, uh, things are loosening up a little bit, maybe, uh, but if you were a prisoner coming out of prison and you had a good plan, let's say for a small business startup, there is no way you're gonna get a loan, a small business loan from any legitimate bank source that you can name. They will not do it. 
So, I mean, essentially, you know, if you're in poverty, you can't get loans from banks. You can't even allow, oftentimes get bank accounts. You can't come out of poverty. Yeah. 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 Kathy, you can Yeah. Yeah. Um, this reminds me of something that happened. I used to teach English as a second language to immigrants. <coughs> and one of them said to me, this is such a great country. I got something in the mail that said I won, you know, a million dollars. <laughs> I love this country. What and somebody country. else said, I got a, another thing that said I could get a thousand dollars in this loan. What, what, yeah. How beautiful is that? It, it occurs to me that there are people who don't understand when they get these things in the mail that they need to use a lot of discernment. We're all used to it. No, seeing this kind of garbage so for right. so many years, our whole lives, but new people coming in the country yeah, are really I, vulnerable. I remember a day and back I, in the late 90s, um, I was a you know, young homeowner with kids, four kids at home, social worker, just very modest income, but the, the amount of like instant financing. I think I got like $60,000 worth of guaranteed loans yeah. in my junk mail that one afternoon back in the 97, 98 before the bubble mm -hmm. really burst. And it was just like, I could see somebody just signing off and just yeah. going on a spree with that, even yeah. one of those letters. Yeah. And there's a one of the things that I do is um, assist with refugee families. And I have an Iraqi refugee family right now that I'm working with. And not being able to read English very well, they get the stuff in the mail, and I literally have to go over there every week and take the mail. And now he knows when I go, shh, yeah. no good, he knows that now. But for a while he's going, oh, how wonderful. And, and now he knows when I say junk mail and rip it in half, that's, it's junk mail. But yes. yeah. he, they, they look to and said, well, gee, they're giving us money. Let, let's shift to the conversation. We talked a little bit about people in, in poverty and people in financial crisis, but just that, that lack of financial literacy, maybe, Jordan, you want to pick it up a little bit? There? Yeah, well, that's uh, one facet of this problem that, that needs to be addressed, and it's really unfortunate that our schools, you know, before, you know, kids graduate from high school, that they don't take a financial literacy class uh, so that they understand what they're get, stepping into when they get all those credit card offers. Mm -hmm. ICCF is doing a lot of great stuff around financial literacy. Why don't you talk about that, Sue? We have, since 1994 or so, um, we have offered financial education as a part of the uh, services that you can receive at ICCF. And um, along with that goes coaching. So the individual work that we do with families that come in, we serve somewhere between four and 500 families or individuals a year that come mm -hmm. in and receive those classes from us. We do outreach to schools. We've worked at Park School. Mm -hmm. We've been over at um, Union School um, in the past. And uh, so we will have financial literacy classes. Um, and actually, <coughs> part of the answer, we believe, to, to this situation is to help people live within their means for the time That's being. Stuff, yeah. and, and, then, uh, and then have goals for their future as far as their um, financial stability in the future and we can help them with that too if it's you know doing better in their education we have what's called an individual development account they can contribute to um, their own account save a thousand dollars and then we match that with federal and local funds um, for post-secondary education for business startup <coughs> as well as for home ownership three one for home ownership so um, so those opportunities are there, um, learning about their finances along the way, becoming more financially savvy, uh, stable in what they have today, and then working towards those goals for the future um, it is really going to help out with you know what's going on in their life right now. Then, in addition to that, um, we're working on a pilot project. We were funded by the Dyer Ives Foundation, and um, we plan to launch any day now a pilot program where people who are trapped in payday loans can come to ICCF, attend our classes, and borrow the money from us to pay off the payday loan. Uh -huh. And then, yeah, and then um, while they're paying us back the money that they borrowed, we're putting some of that money into a savings account. So the hope is, and the goal, our goal for them, um, and we hope it will become their goal, <coughs> is to have a savings account that they can then borrow from themselves when emergencies come up. And then how much interest do you yeah. charge? Okay. Yeah. So we charge, instead of $15 right. on 100 we charge $3 on 100 
And so what that works out in annual percentage rate, so if they borrow that money over and over again for a full year like they would at a payday lender, which we hope they don't, but it would be a 24% annual percentage rate. So 3% on, on the dollar, right? So 3 cents on a dollar, right? So yeah, more like the credit card. Mm -hmm. There's a, go ahead. Let me say this, you know, uh, the substitution for business math that had that was part of the public school curriculum mm -hmm. yeah, right, it was. that <laughs> was ripped out of public school, public education, mm -hmm. business math. Everybody was, when I went to high school, everybody was required to take business math. Mm -hmm. So now here we got seven or eight generations of people that don't even know how to add your checkbook because the government, somebody decided to rip business math out of high school. What? It's worse out of than high school. school. What? When, when I was in high school, a long time before you even, mm -hmm. yeah. okay, they had a course called Family Living. I was, I and they that. talked about, you know, budgets and family budgets, and, and they said 25% of your income could be reserved for housing. Yeah. That doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And and add to that the rising costs of medical mm -hmm. and the other things and and poor people are just you know utilities they're gobbled up by this the cost of their right but they don't, the formulas don't work but they don't even learn I don't care how what kind of mathematician they don't even learn the precepts of the middle concepts. class can't make it work yeah, yeah but they don't learn that. the precepts or concepts that right. there is a mathematical. A system to your existence. Well, See, that's what I'm talking about. What yeah, you right. took a family live at least taught you there is a concept mm -hmm. to living and moving yeah, your family that? forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. not there. Right. The concept of interest. The concept right. Right. of interest. So does everybody we know what ICCF stands for or what other things you do? I mean, might be it be helpful to explain that? Well, I mean, maybe everybody does. Sure. <laughs> um, it, well, I just wanted to kind of follow up on what Paul and Mike were saying um, as far as the, uh, the need for education. We hear so many times people uh, saying, boy, I wish I would have learned this when I was in high school or before I took out that first credit card or that first payday loan and, and over and over again. Um, it, it's just such a, um, a missing link, a missing part of our education system right. today. Um, the Inner City Christian Federation, ICCF, um, has, is celebrating this year 40 years of existence. Um, we're a community development corporation. We're a faith-based um, community developer. We, we do housing counseling. We create um, housing opportunities, both um, shelter, rental, and ownership. So we're all three kinds of um, uh, housing opportunities for people who come to us. We serve about 2,200 families a year between the housing and the outreach services that we do. Um, I mentioned financial management. We also have home ownership enablement classes. We have uh, credit repair. We work with um, fathers who are um, trying to get back connected with their families if they um, if they're paying child support and they lose their job and now they have arrears and maybe they're not seeing their kids anymore. We see how important fathers are in the, the stability of a family. And so we help them find jobs, help them get their finances together. Um, but one of the, the biggest things that we see is the lack of financial stability in families. And so we want to help them build assets in any way that they can, whether that's through ownership, whether it's through their own business, whether it's going back to school and, and helping them uh, just develop those paths in life, the, the goals in life, and, and walk down that path with them as they're attempting to um, to, to bring stability in their family. Quiet, where did you? Oh, three of us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just a no, quick no. question, just on what you were Please. saying was, um, with your financial classes, do you uh, how do you approach credit with people who are learning these skills? There are some financial advisors who say no credit, no way, right. don't do it. Um, 
many of us have found credit to be useful as long as you use it intelligently. Right. How, where, where do you guys come from? Well, um, having been a person who experienced homelessness before, mm -hmm. uh, and who had, I have children um, that were with me, we, we had no place to go, we were really at the bottom. Mm -hmm. and, and I know how important credit was for me to be mm -hmm. able to lift myself out. Um, I certainly would never sit there and say, you know, absolutely do not use credit. I see credit as a tool. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but don't go to the rent to own store to deck your no, living no, room no, no, out, no. right? <laughs> everything in moderation. We live in a, in a microwave world. We want it now. We have to learn self-control. We have to learn how to budget properly. Um, uh, we have to bring ourselves up and out of um, those situations. And the best way to do that is to uh, get our credit straight first, mm -hmm. live within our means, learn how to manage what it is that we have and to pay the bills that we have, and then learn the secrets of increasing credit scores because you're not going to get a good opportunity with um, credit rate and, and, and those mm -hmm. kinds of things until you have uh, a good payment history somewhere. Excellent. And so, and so yeah, we'll do excellent. things like, um, yeah. like uh, we have partners <coughs> with partnerships with banks and will help people get a small loan, a $300 loan. They can make payments on it and bring their credit score up dramatically. And once they have a good credit score, then they can access more credit at those reasonable rates rather than those um, really uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged, it's very briefly, just to hear that there are foundations and, and big money people supporting ICC, a federal organization like that. You know, because, I mean, I'll say this program has been known to slag to Rich a little bit. <laughs> from time to time. And, and I think deservedly so. But, you know, it's not like the rich are just completely vulturing on the poor. Um, it, and I guess my question is, you know, how complacent are we just about poverty in this society? I know that's a very huge issue, but it just seems like we're way too comfortable with the fact that so many people Families, kids, young people, working people are just drowning in debt and never getting ahead. I mean, that's just draining the life out of our society. In that's so right. That's, that's so right. We have uh, so many families that come to us who are just drowning in student loans. And they, yes. they, they, they are working so, 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 right. so far. Right. Um, and there are mm -hmm. secrets to that. There, there are ways out of that. There are, there's opportunities to make contact. Don't ignore it. Right. Um, make contact and, and, and offer what you can, um, stretch it out for a long time until you're to that point where you can afford to make those higher payments. Yep. But it's all within that reasonable budget uh, where you can live, um, where you can understand your limitations, um, don't go after things. We, we have so many people come in, we're just blessed with this wealth of knowledge in our community and, and folks will come in and talk to the families in our programs and explain to them how to make their dollars stretch the farthest. And, and that's really where do, your, where do your, <laughs> where do your referrals where? come from? How, how do people get into <coughs> your system? They walk um, in the front door? Walk in, or? walk in the front door, they really? hear about it from their friends and family members, they meet somebody who's living in our housing. Um, we receive referrals from the Salvation Army for our homeless shelter. Um, we have so many partners in the community. So it's just, we're blessed with just so many. Um, great people who yeah. send folks our way. I have an example of a smaller organization that does something I'd like to share. We, you mentioned people coming home from prison, and a lot of times those folks have a gap in their lives in terms of learning. They don't practice much inside prison about managing money because they don't have any money. And so the skills that they never had when they went in just kind of get even less attention and then they come home and have fees and fines and court costs and yeah. child payments and child support payments and all kinds of expenses and can't get a job. And so you've got a huge uh, barrier to success. But there's one small organization in town called Living Water Prison Ministry Network that has purchased a couple of homes, and especially people who come home with criminal sexual conduct offenses and have certain areas that they cannot live in because of law. They can live in these homes for free until they get a job and once they get a job they make a donation back to the organization and they make give twenty percent of their paycheck and Linda, who is the bookkeeper for this <coughs> small group of nine men, puts it into the account and labels it for them so that when they do get enough capital to maybe make a down payment on a, to rent them 
a home or something, they get that back. But she helps them follow this whole Dave Ramsey thing, and you were referring yeah. to not mm -hmm. not having not using credit at all. Well, he doesn't ever recommend that. Right. But of course, I don't hear too many people who say I'm set free on Dave <laughs> Ramsey who are talking about not making. You know, they're making big money, most of them. Mm -hmm. That's right. They've got into debt because they've been greedy and, you know, had two, their, two right. incomes over $80,000 and I can't make my house payment. Oh, you yeah. know, and you feel yeah. real sorry. They want to get free. Yeah. yeah. And so, so they can pay yeah, off. It's not reasonable for a low income person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Right. You right. Can't, right. You can't, uh, but what do you think income. of that model, uh, all of you or any of you? Because it's, it's sort of like you're holding hands for a while. Right. But at the same time, trying to help people develop a, some hope. Or well, have you're some also hope. developing community. It's, it's yeah. Been, it's, you're not, I mean, and, and Dave Ramsey's crowd is the McMansion group. You know, mm. people who are more individualistic and just you know doing their thing. But yeah, I think you know lifting people out of poverty can't just be a one by one. It shouldn't really have to be people joining together. Sometimes you got to share resources. You know, ride sharing or. You know, mutual child care or any number of sort of yes. shortcuts that you can take to lower your overall expenses. You know, I mean, those are some strategies that have to be considered. Yeah. The elephant in the room, okay, let's not leave this discussion without talking about payday raises. Okay, there's nothing like a raise, you know, you know like $10 an hour raise, versus yeah. 750 an hour sure. to allow somebody to perhaps pay off some of those mm -hmm. bills and climb out of poverty. I don't even know that $10 an hour is going to do it, but You're right. well, it's, 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 we don't have small. jobs for the poor, and mm -hmm. we don't have jobs above the minimum wage that can sustain them. Right. Mm -hmm. We need job training. We need a lot of resources that that haven't been developed to the point where they need to be developed, okay? Mm -hmm. And and we do need a minimum wage law, like what Connecticut instituted, $10.10. Yeah. They, they, they took it. And I've seen Connecticut do other things before for the poor. But when I went there and bought shoes for my kids, there were no taxes on shoes. There was 7% mm -hmm. on everything else, but you didn't pay taxes on shoes mm -hmm. because you might be poor. Mm -hmm. And kids had to have shoes. So you drove all the way to Connecticut to buy shoes? <laughs> <laughs> I was visiting, but you know, <laughs> they didn't ask me if I was there. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, some, some states, I mean, it's possible. Michigan has a proposal to have the $10 yeah. Well, yeah. Is, is it to put it on the ballot. Yeah. 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 What bothers that, right? me Why about can't the, the legislators wage? do it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What bothers me about the minimum wage is it's still not a livable wage. Yeah. No. Right. No. Right. I just, right. You know, but I, it's I, a I, move I'm, in I'm the fearful, right direction. I'm fearful that, okay, we're going to raise the minimum wage. Who'll be? And then, okay, there it is. The corporations will the raise their prices. <laughs> And, and Everybody's going to raise their prices yeah. in proportion. You know, it's still That's what happens. Well, when you get a raise <coughs> with your social security, you know, you're gonna lower what happens profits. is That's down, at, when I worked down here at Touchstone, where every time they got a raise on their social security, the, home, the, the renter raised their price. Hmm. So it's like people are going broke safe. Because if you don't get an expendable amount of money or you get a chance to use some of that raise, it's no good. Because when you when they give you a raise, when they raise Social Security, you bet your bottom dollar that those poor houses that they live in are going to raise the rent. Mm -hmm. They're going to raise the rent. See, we nickel and dime everybody. Yeah, you yeah. nickel and dime <coughs> we, everybody. And, and, and it's the same thing with a raise. You can get a raise, but then now it's time to up your insurance. Correct. Yeah. And well, your insurance goes up. Right. You know, hey, and Mike, you're paying part you, of your you, insurance. You're talking about what I'm talking about. That's Mike exactly. has a final answer there. You can either raise the you can raise the wages or you, you can lower the profits. Uh, well, profits I think also well, on the minimum wage <coughs> is when they yeah. do statistics, the number of people who are over twenty one but under thirty who make and the number of females who make minimum wage. I know it's way over fifty percent. I think it's around two thirds. Um, so that there's a lot of working mothers who just make minimum wage and can't afford. And a lot of them work for companies where the companies actually have people who help them get food stamps, which means that we're subsidizing the corporations who are paying people money. And they're making the new food money. Food yeah. Yeah. And indentured making, servants. Yeah. Uh -huh. New yeah. slavery, new indentured servants, and that's, that's where they're going to keep them at. We talk about business and the people that most small business fail from the lack of capitalization. 
So what is capitalization? It's not all money. Capitalization is not all money. So most people out there in business don't know that lack of capitalization is not all money. You got insurance products, you got financial products, and you got saving accounts, you got put and take dollars and all those different types of structured dollars that you have to have to operate a business. So most people fail that's in business from the lack of capitalization. I used to be an insurance a broker, so I yeah, know a little bit about Yeah, well, I can hear, but I, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about the problems, and yeah. I think we all know that, man, these problems, they seem insurmountable. But what I'm encouraged about is there are places like what they're doing them, you know, and, and Micah yeah. Center that has taken the you know, taking a stance and going after, you know, just shed the light on this kind of stuff. Yeah, and a lot of faith-based groups do offer financial literacy mm -hmm. classes do. that are even different. It's not just ICCF, but I yeah. don't at all. But the, the, the loan product is really something that's unique to ICCF. Okay. And for someone who's um, concerned about this issue of payday lending and wants to do something concrete, um, I'm sure ICCF is, is going to be looking to expand this this program. And so... Uh, for someone to to, uh, to consider making a financial contribution specifically for that program, I think that'd be a very concrete step that that anyone could take. I think we should go after the J.P. Morgans of this country. <laughs> well, the J, the Chase J.P. Morgan, the Fifth Thirds, you know, all those banks that have that have taken on some predatory practices. They need to come back to the piper. Well, is that part of what I wasn't clear on what Micah does? Do you advocate for changing and changes in laws and that kind of thing, or how do you how do you work? Uh, we we look for opportunities to um, educate people, the community, mm -hmm. about the biblical call to do justice, and we also uh, share our thoughts with legislators about the direction that we, we think they should go. Well, and, I, and I think, you know, Mike, you know, your point, we've got to, you know, at some point the corporations are going to have to lower the profits. I, I don't think we should just give up that point too easily or just say cynical, well, they're just going to take their money. Right? I mean, there is a sense in which the people at the top of the pyramid, if you will, those who are prospering and profiting the most from the society, have to have some sort of moral reckoning. Are they building <laughs> up a society? Well, well and, and this comes from a, a cultural and a political mm -hmm. and a social mm -hmm. sense that, you know, this nation needs to, you know, fulfill its dreams and aspirations of opportunity, yeah. of equality, of justice. Yeah. And I think the MICA Center is, is appealing to that, even within the prosperous West Michigan business mm -hmm. community, which mm -hmm. often ascribes to certain Christian biblical principles. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong by saying, hey, folks, let's walk the talk, let's, let's live up to our ideals, mm -hmm. and let's use the old rhetoric, the rising tide that lifts all boats, and even concepts of trickle-down economics, you know, prosperity. <laughs> I mean, I know as discredited and as cynical as they are, if you just camp yourself out of that, it's like, ah, forget it, they're never going to care, I think you're giving up a part of the fight. I mean, Gandhi certainly was dealing with some hardcore, mm -hmm. selfish materialists, he did appeal to their conscience, but so did Martin Luther King. It did get results. I think we have to keep that struggle going. Yeah. Yeah. But I think well, there's also a need to educate people. Well, sure. Um, like, I had one of my first college boyfriends who got a scholarship to an Ivy League school, had a sister who wasn't too bright. And she, in high school, um, became a hairdresser. She took, but her mother made sure she took business classes so that when she graduated, she would be able to eventually own her own business, and she would know how to do the bookkeeping, and mm -hmm. how to do the, you know, not you just go. to cut hair, right. but also how to run a business and mm -hmm. to be able to or make it on her own. her book keeper is doing it the right way. Yeah, right. 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 yes. That's the best thing. Yeah, that's the best thing. <laughs> <That's laughs> <best thing. laughs> but you're right. You're 100% right. Those yeah, skills. You know, those skills, and it, because I used to work with a lot of um, actors, musicians, artists who are, and trying to teach a jazz musician that he's really in business. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> but they are. I mean, they have to keep records. They need to uh, well, I mean, you know, pay their you know, bills. How many of the great bills? pioneers of rock and roll and jazz just yes. went up penniless because they got oh, yeah. Yeah. Brandon, you like your hand yeah. up here. There, there were two points I wanted to make. One is very simple, and one is very global. Um, I get my hair cut at a little 
salon, 44th and Kalamazoo. Um, I went back there after I, I had gotten my hair cut there 20 years ago. Um, when they were known as David and Company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to my hairstylist the other day because they are now this sort of weird place where you you call and make an appointment with a hairdresser, but it's not David and Company. I was trying to just figure out what it was. Well, she told me that, that David, as he got older, got out of the business, but he sold at a very reasonable price the business to the hairstylists. So they, they are now owner operators. Okay. And, and what he did, which was particularly generous in that business, is he gave, he left them the customer list. He didn't take the customer lists and run with them mm -hmm. off to his own mm -hmm. um, new business. Mm -hmm. um, I just saw David last week. No. <laughs> <laughs> and he, yeah, he, he works out of his home and he's trying to retire. And I go, you can't retire, you're yeah. not right here. And, and so he's created a, a set of owner owner operators. Mm -hmm. who That's are, huge. Yeah. Which, which is huge. Mm -hmm. the, the other one, the global issue I wanted to address is there's a set of TED Talks. Mm -hmm. uh, you may have seen some of these. It's TED Talks out of Berkeley by an, uh, Nanda Wa, who's an Indian scholar. She's a scholar of urban planning and poverty. And in her, one of her little 10 minute talks, she turns the question we deal with with poverty on its head. Instead of asking how do we solve the problem of poverty, she asks who causes poverty? Um, and she addresses one particular thing that I think is quite toxic in our society. And it's this idea that we solve the problem of poverty globally by shopping, by buying fair trade product here, by no donating to the this or that fund a couple dollars here. And suddenly solving poverty seems like a simple, comfortable thing. Mm -hmm. which I think is particularly toxic mm -hmm. for our, our middle and upper middle class societies you where... You feel good. It's got yeah, the label on it. feel great um, to, to do these simple things. Right. But it keeps us from ever addressing any of the real issues yeah. that create mm -hmm. poverty. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of the real issues are, though, how you shop and where you buy. Yeah. Yeah. Think of Maggie yeah. Anderson, who wrote the book our black year where yeah. she tried to only buy from businesses that were owned by people of color mm -hmm. not just people who work there yeah. an, an interesting thing in her book too is how long a dollar stays in certain communities mm -hmm. let's take the Asian community mm -hmm. dollar might stay there for 26 days mm -hmm. another community let's just say African American community. Stay well, that's the last one. Yeah. African community it stays an stay hour. One hour. Yeah. Or less. Well, I don't 30 know minutes. about that, Paul. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I think the, the money given to the poor in, in whatever form it comes, you know, stays in the community and, and adds to. Mm -hmm. It should. Uh, it's it's where you go spend the money at. Yeah. yeah. So if you have it's a how the money still. stays in the community. Yeah. It's yeah. who you spend that dollar with. Mm -hmm. that's so, like, so I got to go, if you give me the money, to go to the store, if I want to get a price, a decent price, then I'm going to have to roll out of the inner city mm -hmm. because when I go to that ma and pa down there, they're going to charge me the overhead on their goods is going to be insurmountable. And the other thing, if you buy from the ma and pa, the money that they get, they have to go out of the right. community That's to get right. their product. Because they're not going to warehouses. Or right. Exactly. Right. 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 But, but even right. like with Walmart, they say mm -hmm. it makes, they make 18% or they get 18% of the food staff money in the country. Mm -hmm. It goes to Walmart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they have to keep yeah. a lot of um, their employees on food stamps. And then that gets recycled. And they get right. to recycle which, is so, which is so unfortunate, which is yeah. where the employees cash yeah. their check yeah. at the Walmart bank right. and they go shopping yeah. and Walmart gets and all their money right back. Yeah. So that money stays in that cycle. Right. Yeah. It comes mm -hmm. out of my community within an hour and mm -hmm. yeah. goes into that yeah. cycle. Hashtag yeah. correct. Yep. And and I, yeah. You oh, made a good point there. And, and, and that's where we need to look for like, yeah, alternative, uh, yeah. alternative uh, business models mm -hmm. that are treating their workers yeah. fairly. I think um, there are a lot of us who are already thinking about that, but 
if, if we had more information about which businesses in our communities, if we knew, you know, which restaurants treated their servers better than others, you know, some, some servers do all right, other servers are just scraping by. Uh, and if we, if we were more inten intentional as consumers and uh, sponsoring, you know, supporting the businesses that were, were paying their workers fairly, um, I think we're already making some progress, but I think there's a lot more progress that could be made. I think yeah. you got a great it's point. I just <laughs> went to a local um, car repair shop. Um, I used to do it where I work now. I'm over on this end of town. And I just have the feeling it's Community Automotive on Fulton, and he's got mm -hmm. a shop local thing there. And sometimes you can walk in and almost feel that, yeah, yeah. this is a decent place. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a decent know, place. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And you just... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a pie in the sky idea, but you can get a, a, a sense sometimes. <laughs> but speaking of cars, what's the story about that some place like goal. Car City? Yeah, that was not <laughs> Sorry, Chester. <clears throat> but what's the deal with Car City or some places like that where you you get a car? And well, the, pick, the JD oh, by Ryder. Yeah. I mean, where they again JD the interest Lander? rates are jacked up. It, it, right. And get then you if you don't car. make your payment, your car doesn't start. Can That's they do right. that remotely? They sure. Yeah. 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 All you do is you press the cell phone. Right. That's one of the biggest um, predatory lender uh, types here in, in our community. Those buy here, pay here, car places, the, uh, oh, the rent to owns, the pawn yeah. shops, yeah. all of those are, are really there to to work off the backs you know, of, of low income yeah. families um, yeah. and, and take huge advantage of, of them with their interest rates and yeah. fees and their uh, unreasonable Terms that go along with that, like you said, um, you, get, you go out and try to start your car if you're so you can't drive over late. to make the payment. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Go ahead, Justin. My, my question is all about how do we prevent predatory lenders from getting established in the low-income community? No way. Yeah. Well, the, the Grand uh, Rapids uh, City even. Council apparently had some right. some experience with that very recently to say let's put the brakes on, let's let's slow it down. Um, obviously, if the local community, the urban community, can be educated to the point that, you know, I know they just opened up, I know there's nice people in there, but you really don't want to do business with them, the business will go away because they're just not getting the customers. So, but I think if you also it by zoning. Uh, zoning, right. But you also and need to give people other opportunities. Well, that's, right. You're yeah, that's right. That's right. You, you can, can go to ICCF or MICA Center and they will help you find money. Right. They'll help you do budgeting <coughs> and not just, well, don't, these are bad people to go in the store. We're well, hoping that, that right. We're hoping that the pilot that we're doing is going to prove that you can charge a very low interest rate without fees, <laughs> without um, all putting all the burdens on the borrower and, and allow uh, other lending type places, whether it's banks or credit unions or wherever, the post office, right. <laughs> the most recent uh, iteration and, and thoughts about that, you, you probably have opinions one way or another about the post office being a lender again, but um, perhaps that's, a, that, that's something that could happen. And, and if they can charge a low enough rate and really meet that need in the community, then we can put those uh, places out of business. That are, so, uh, just the really sense that but you said the post office is a lender again? Yeah. Uh, well, there was something yes, um, there was put some into uh, to, to legislation about that. That they, I guess, they used to be a lender back in you know eighteen nineteen hundreds and uh, at what interest rate? Yeah. I mean, I, and I, I really don't know. You know, it's also maybe this is the way we can save our a lot better than what's going on now. Yeah. Right? Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Personal experience, I. Um, I was unemployed for a while, and then before that, I was working, and I was only making nine dollars, nine dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. And I got myself. I was. I always paid all my bills, always on time. I never got behind, but I got into some credit card debt. And I'm honestly telling you, the credit card debt wasn't because I was out buying stuff or out having a fancy social life. It was. It was between paychecks. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't go to a loan. You know, I didn't go to a loan shop, but I would use my credit card for gas, for food. Um, mm -hmm. So I was nickel and diming myself, mm -hmm. and suddenly that nickel and diming. And one of the things I can honestly say is that I would encourage somebody to get financial coaching because I, I do think it, it, it helps. It's helped me learn a little bit more about budgeting. Um, I, I have a financial coach at Goodwill. My only other problem is is now I am I want to consolidate, and I don't know how to consolidate. 
My credit, uh, my credit union helped me when my wife and I were first married 33 years ago. The teacher's credit union called and he says, if you, uh, no, it was Bell Telephone Credit Union. If you want to consolidate all your credit card debt and pay it off in a year, we'll take this loan at whatever the rate was, 8% or whatever, but you have to pay it off in a year. And she had a lot of debts on her credit cards, and I had some of mine, and we thought, well, geez, we'll be out of debt with credit cards in a year, and we can make this single payment. And we did it. And we haven't had credit card debt since, other than we use the cards and pay it but off. But it's finding out who you can yeah. trust, because mm -hmm. I'm not but even looking, because I don't know who I can trust. But they came to us and said, we've got a thing for you that makes money for them. It was, it was a win-win situation, and I'll tell you, it saved us a bundle of money. We got started on the right financial footing. That's great. We cut yeah, back on the number of credit cards and charge accounts. But I think sometimes people are afraid to go to a financial coach because because it's 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 scary. Nobody wants to look at that stuff. Nobody yeah. wants to admit that mm -hmm. they're they feel they're feeling helpless. You know, mm -hmm. nobody yeah. and it's mm -hmm. I, I hate to say this, but having somebody look at your finances is almost as intimate as having sex. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know what I mean? No, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean I know that sounds kind of... That's what no, that's my, my, my tax you know, accountant, you know, know after uh, I, first time I went to him after I moved from Holland, I had to get a new accountant and he looked at, looked at all my stuff and he goes, I know everything there is about yes. you. <laughs> and I, I used to do taxes. You know, if people are getting, a, if a couple is getting along or not, just the way they react to each other. I mean, you know everything about them. <laughs> well, and the creditors love me because my credit, actually my credit rating is good because I pay off my credit and my credit cards have, um, I have a high, a high amount and I'm not even near, mm -hmm. you know. And you would probably be a perfect candidate for um, one of the kinds of loans that Mike just talked about, you know, a, a consolidation loan. Um, especially if you have the collateral to, to See, I don't have enough. collateral. Okay. We didn't, so, they didn't say collateral. They just said you had to do it in a 12 month period. Okay. And, you know, they put and the, you, here's the payments, here's the most. And right. by the way, it was 1980. <laughs> and you know, interest rates were 18% yeah, right. there at the prime. Nice. And they, they gave us an 8% loan. I mean, this wow. is a credit union that was working for its members. Yeah. And that's yeah, the kind of loaning is. institutions. Mm -hmm. Poor people have That's to what have we access credit to more yes. development mm -hmm. whatever. A community right. development credit union. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that, would that, would yeah. that would be perfect. We don't have one. Yeah. Big bank time. shouldn't be doing banking yeah. with right. people. Yeah. Not with but the right. 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 They right. stick to their right. stuff that they're good at. Blame President Clinton for getting rid of Glass Steagall. Who? Who what? Blame President Clinton for getting rid of the wall between investment banking I know, I and, yeah. and, and yeah. Yeah. there was supposed yeah, to be a deregulation. Wall. Separate. Oh, Ronald Reagan was the first to deregulate. He deregulated, started deregulating in 1980. Well, yeah. You know, yeah. in 1980, he says, "Let's deregulate all the banks." And from that point, 1980 on, because I remember we had what we call a budget shifting breakfast. <laughs> Budget shifting luncheon, and Ronald Reagan said, "Let's deregulate everything." So Clinton might have picked it up, but well, Ronald started. It. Well, Clinton was playing bargaining yes. chips oh, with a sure. hostile. Oh, Congress. thank you for clearing that up. <laughs> they they, they, they regulated the savings and loan industry uh, during that period of time in 1984. And there was a Michigan senator that went down there too because he was one of the four senators who approved it. Yeah. And the savings and loans people went flat mm -hmm. out, and we had right. to bail them out. Remember? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that was deregulate and let them do their thing. And boy, I tell you, so I'll take well, the now numbers. we have credit unions that are doing brokerage. See, that's that's a scary thing. That's because great. the deregulation opened up the brokerage business yeah. for everybody. So now I go to my credit union and, 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 and ask them investment questions. Which Could I get questions. some uh, a, a little bit more information about this community development credit union? What sure. Is that? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, community development financial institutions, that's sort of the global way to cover it. That there's, there's a bunch of different ways for uh, a place to operate like that. Um, basically, the Department of, of the Treasury, the United States Department of Treasury, funds um, community development financial institutions. And what those do is, is focus on the community. They have a target market. They um, provide loans. They're, they can be an investment. 
a uh, place where you can have investments. They could be a, a venture capitalist fund. Mm -hmm. um, they can be a loan fund. It, they can operate in all different kinds of ways. Isn't it true they can also deal with people who don't have accounts? They sure can, and and they can. Uh, so they, the, they the use the capital. Can't, get it, can't even get into a payday mm -hmm. loan That's store because right. they're just off the edge of the earth or something. Right. But it, you it, said that there aren't any. There aren't any here in in, um, in West Michigan that operate as sort of a depository or a loan place. There are some, um, like in Lansing, there, there's a couple of them, and, and but those lend to um, community developers. So we ICCF could receive money from a CDFI um, that operates out of um, out of Lansing or, or whatever. Yeah, there's one in Ann Arbor. I think there's one down in Battle Creek, um, if I'm not mistaken. There's a few. There's a handful in Michigan, um, but why so few? What? What I? Pardon me. I don't understand why. There's why there's all these poor people out there? Yeah, why? I know. Um, I I think that they they typically operate as a nonprofit. Um, you have to have the investment behind it, so local investment and in something like that, and then. The local investment, you, you leverage those funds at the federal level, um, and then you can there get the capital. Right. Um, it, it's something that we've aspired to at ICCF for a long time. Um, it, it's just kind of gaining the momentum under yeah. that I just time wonder if the West Michigan business culture is like, don't, doesn't really want to go there. I think yeah. that they would be a little bit nervous yeah. to, to see a CDFI come in because it, um, it would serve the needs of the lower income population, you would, in your situation, would be able to very easily go to a CDFI and borrow the money to pay off and borrow at a very uh, oh, lucrative wow. interest rate. I mean, mm -hmm. it would be That's perfect. great information. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but there's kind of too much money to be made with the status if quo no, to allow this to happen. Are, right. We are running close to the end of our time mm -hmm. limit. Mm -hmm. Jordan, I know you wanted to kind of maybe speak, so maybe we can start wrapping yeah. up some our final thoughts or just some, some you know, Maybe some other perspective of what the Micah Center is doing to, to address this issue. Uh, well, uh, we're you know we're looking to engage other people who want to use their voice to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves, uh, defend the rights of the poor, the right of the poor that's being challenged and um, not respected in this situation is the right to borrow money at a reasonable interest rate. We believe that people should be able to borrow money at a reasonable interest rate, uh, and we think that. Uh, that there are a lot of other people who think the same way and that uh, that we can uh, speak what we believe to those who have the, the power to change how things are and then we can get something done here and, and Grand Rapids could be a model city. Yeah, I, I think that's a good, a good kind of optimistic, forward-looking uh, perspective to kind of, you know, because, yeah, poverty sucks. I and mean, it is a very, it's a very daunting problem. And even though Jesus himself said, the poor shall be with you always, you don't have to be that poor, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Lord. <Yeah. laughs> you know, we don't need to just grind yeah. it into the dust. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other um, spirit? <laughs> yeah. Are there any other uh, places that we can refer people for issues like uh, having um, wanting to go to a lending store instead of going to a lending store? Yeah. Other places uh, that uh, either of you can recommend before we. Well, we would love to talk to, with them at ICCF. And yeah. how, how are they getting touch with the ICCF? Sure, our, our phone number is three three six nine three three three. Pretty well, easy. Six one six area code six, of course. Six one six. Do they ask for you or? Um, sure, they can ask for me. My name is Sue Ortiz. And, Sue Ortiz. Um, Ortiz, okay. yeah. And and I'm uh, I'm in the Housing and Family Services Division. Um, so our location? Just, our location is 920 Cherry. We're just around the corner from the here. Old um, the old D.A. Blodgett building. It's, it's a beautiful uh, four-story uh, building that we uh, rehabbed about um, seven years ago. And uh, we welcome everybody. It doesn't matter if you're low income or not. If you're thinking about going to a payday lending store, and we know that there's plenty of teachers and, and um, nurses and, and, and folks that, that Get caught up in that as well, you know. We just I should always have a good art exhibit. <laughs> we do. Right? Yeah. 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 We just want to <laughs> hang out and walk around the floor. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Yeah. 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 And then a couple of years ago, you did a uh, light show on the building outside, which was yes. incredible. <laughs> that was pretty cool. And you got a and nice <laughs> room up there where people could come mm -hmm. and. Uh, with the room out too. That's right. Yeah, I'm, I've been Richard up there Hall. too. It's beautiful. Up there. There's a footnote to that too. The Micah Center has a book club 
that meets at the ICCF every other week. Yeah. And their latest book we took up was Why Don't They Get a Job? <laughs> and it talks about the highly successful program that Cincinnati Works put out for poor people to lift them up out of poverty. And that book's worth getting, yeah. It's an eye opener on the complexities of dealing with this, and I'm glad ICCF yeah. is into it. Thank you so much. Good book. And do you course. have a place for people to call or be in touch with? Well, I mean, we, we have our meetings at the Micah Center. Uh, we meet within Hope Reform Church, which is located at the corner of Burton and Kalamazoo, 2010 Kalamazoo Avenue Southeast. The first Tuesday of every month, we have a justice-focused lecture coming up on Tuesday, May 6th. We're going to have uh, an informative presentation about worker centers. Worker centers are a model being used across the country to equip workers to understand what their rights are and, more importantly, how to exercise those rights. Um, because a lot of people really aren't sure what their rights are and they really don't know how to exercise them um, without, without facing reper repercussions. Uh, so. Uh, then on the third Tuesday of every month, our advocacy groups meet. We have advocacy groups uh, working on issues from the environment, poverty, hunger, beyond prisons, transportation, healthcare, immigration, education, pay lending, and wait stuff. I remember one of them. All right. Uh, so lots of different issues. Uh, good people come together to try to get something done, trying to focus on, well, what can we do about these issues? What time do those meetings begin? <laughs> those meetings, uh, first Tuesdays begun, begin at 7 p.m., Mm -hmm. uh, third Tuesdays, we have a light meal from 5.30 to 6.15. Uh, then from 6.15 to 7, we have updates from a couple of our advocacy groups because we want the whole community to be in on the loop on what our different groups are up to so we can support each other. And then from 7 to 8, our different advocacy groups meet. Oh, okay. That's fantastic. And where is the Micah Center? It's uh, Burton in Kalamazoo, 2010 Kalamazoo Avenue Southeast within Hope Reform Church. Oh, Hope Reform. Great. All right. Dave, can I put a yeah. plug in? Sure, uh, I, I forgot to mention, one of our the big things that we do at ICCF is to help stop foreclosure. And so mm -hmm. if you know somebody you that's right running there, yeah. into trouble with paying their mortgage, mm -hmm. uh, with okay. paying their taxes, um, anything like that, please send them our way. We yeah. would love to help talk through. There are so many programs out there and, and still it's a, a big concern in the community, even though it's not as huge as it was. Mm -hmm. I wish I had ago. known. I have yeah. watched our neighbors. I mean, oh. I have watched that yeah. happen. And yeah, yeah, it's a horrible so thing. It is People horrible. Their home. Yeah. And oh, so we would like so to I walk will. with them. No for the future. Thank you. Plus you can also take volunteers like uh, Habitat from Human, right? Yes. yes. Oh, right. We work with Habitat very closely. And so you do, and you do love, homes? And we do build homes and we would love people to volunteer and help us out with that. All right. Thank thank you. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you everybody for your contributions to the chat tonight. Uh, we do want to thank our sponsor, the Mayan Buzz Cafe. Chester there with a little uh, logo and a uh, little uh, <laughs> merchandise <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Nice. Love from the, yeah, the human really yeah, right. Right. <laughs> But we know we do appreciate the Mind Bus Cafe. Yes. Their their contributions to the beverages and snacks. That's another reason to maybe come on out and join us again the first Thursday of the month. Generally, and they're open twenty four hours. Yeah, sure. Where is the Bus Cafe? Two or eight, Granville Southwest, at the corner of Granville and Cherry. They're by the um, station. station, by the bus station. That's, oh, right. where the, that's where the bicycles have all the difficulty. They have a lot of accidents down there. I am not certain, but I know with Kitty Corner from where the uh, it, the uh, inter intersection is, intersection oh, yeah. bar. Oh. Yeah. Well, it's Kitty Corner. Melted, so hopefully that's any bike. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, so for this episode of IGE Talks, I'm David Blakesley once again signing out. Thank you for tuning in. Find us on Facebook, find us on the web, give us your feedback. What do you think? Uh, how do you like the program? Do you have ideas for future topics? We're always kind of probing the headlines and the world around us to say, what are we going to talk about next month? So we'll see you all in May. Again, thanks for watching and tuning in. Peace. Peace. <laughs> <laughs>